In September 1943, the Western Allies opened a new front in the war against fascism when they invaded Italy. Within days, the Italian military and government surrendered, leaving the Germans on their own. The campaign was meant to be a quick victory, although it turned into a slog. The Germans were few, but represented some of the best units in the Wehrmacht. They were commanded by Albert Kesselring, who showed a knack for defensive warfare. He and his commanders used Italy's rough terrain to slow down the Allied push towards Rome. The Allies were also hampered by the upcoming invasion of France, and vital resources and units were gradually transferred to Britain. By November 1943, the Allies were desperate for a victory that could secure Rome. On November 25, 1943, Bernard Law Montgomery's 8th Army launched an offensive on the Adriatic coast. His plan was to pierce the Gustav Line, which was Kesselring's main defensive line. His men would then take the ports of Ortona and Pescara and push towards Rome, hopefully taking the city before both Christmas and the long-expected invasion of France. Montgomery was popular with the troops. He made sure they were well cared for and he often rode along the front lines giving speeches. Although he was a methodical commander, he could, when frustrated or under pressure, launch a poorly prepared attack. His November offensive lacked enough manpower to achieve his goals and underestimated German resistance and the weather. Montgomery's opposite was Joaquin Lemelson, who led the 10th Army. He was considered a top-rate infantry tactician, but found himself commanding the 5th Panzer Division in the invasion of France. He commanded armored forces in the invasion of Russia, where he reported that German war crimes would only strengthen the resolve of the Soviets. After Kursk, he spent most of the war in Italy, attaining a reputation as a capable defensive commander. The offensive opened with an attack by the 78th Infantry Division and the 8th Indian Division, with the 2nd New Zealand Division later pitching in. They were opposed by the 1st Parachute Division, considered among the best formations in the German war machine. The fighting along the Sangro River was intense. The 78th Infantry Division alone lost 4,000 men in just a few days. Although the Gustav Line was penetrated, the losses and lack of reserves made it hard for Montgomery to exploit the breakthrough. In addition, Kesselring sent the 90th Panzer Grenadier Division to aid in the area's defense. On December 4th, Montgomery tapped the 1st Canadian Infantry Division and the 1st Armored Brigade to keep the offensive going. The Canadians were known among the Germans as the Red Patch Devils and had acquitted themselves well at Sicily. On December 5th, the Canadians attacked across the Moro River, just south of Ortona. The fighting was brutal, made worse by weather that alternated from rain to snow, with the landscape becoming a just sea of mud. On December 12th, the Germans decided to fortify Ortona, as it became clear Montgomery was not willing to halt the offensive. The Allied High Command expected the Germans to fall back to the Ariely River and only contest Ortona with a token force. Generally, street fighting had been sparse in Italy, in part because such fighting was hard for generals to control and losses were often heavy on both sides. In Italy, the Germans used mostly rivers and hills for defensive positions. Ortona, though, would be fiercely contested. In preparation, buildings were demolished to use the rubble as entrenchments. Traps were also set. Among them were toilets that would explode once the plunger was pressed. Not until December 15th were the German lines on the Moro River penetrated, and not until December 20th did the Germans retreat to Ortona itself. By now, Montgomery had given up his hopes of taking Rome, but he still wanted to secure Ortona and crossing on the Aurelia River before the weather got any worse. Pescara, which Montgomery had expected to take before December, was no longer seen as a viable objective. Ortona was a small coastal city that dated back to the Bronze Age. Most of its buildings were medieval, and according to tradition, it was founded by refugees from the Trojan War. It was not a strategically important city, although it had a good port. Its streets were narrow, creating a maze-like grid that aided the defenders. The Germans also used the town's railroad tunnels to shield their men, particularly during heavy bombardment. On December 21st, the Canadians attacked and seized part of the suburbs of Artona. The next day, the battle became more general with an infantry and tank assault. At one point, the tanks stopped when it was feared the Germans had mined the area. 
Major Jim Stone admonished the lead tank, yelling, You armored sissy. I've got 20 to 30 men here with no damned armor at all. They're worth a million dollars apiece. You're just a bunch of goddamn armored sissies. The tanks refused to budge, and the Germans were alerted in time to stop the attack. On December 23rd, Major General Christopher Vokes, commander of the 1st Canadian Division, changed his tactics. Vokes was known for his fiery temper and was given to swearing. Artona was his first action in division command, and Montgomery held him in very low regard. Once the initial attack into Ortona failed, Vokes decided the best way to take the city was to surround it and force the Germans to retreat or face destruction. The move north was carried out and pressed even further as darkness fell. In one day, Vokes' men managed to threaten the German escape route, but they lacked the manpower to seal it. By now, Adolf Hitler had taken an interest in the town's defense in order to be held to the very last man. Back in Ortona, Canadian engineers implemented a relatively new tactic. They used explosives to blow holes in buildings in order to seize them. It became known as mouse holing, and it worked. However, sometimes the charges were not enough or too much, leading to complaints from the high command. In response, Sergeant Harry Rankin told some officers, We aren't exactly practicing scientific demolitions here. House by house, the town was taken, the fighting continuing into Christmas Eve. That day, the Canadians saw heavy fighting at the Piazza San Francisco, which was dubbed Dead Horse Square by the Canadians. In one attack, the Canadians took a nearby school, only for the Germans to demolish the building, killing all but one of the soldiers who occupied it. The square itself could not be taken until the nearby Santa Maria de Constantinopoli church was seized. Corporal Gord Turnbull, commanding a Sherman tank, relented when ordered to shell the church, saying, It's Christmas Eve, and that's God's house. Reluctantly, he opened fire after receiving a second order to do so. The church's tower came down, and the church itself was secured in a hand grenade assault that went into Christmas morning. When it was over, there were no Germans left alive, and the church was a scattered mess of bodies and blood. Christmas Day saw the fighting rage on as the Germans tried to widen their escape route. They failed, and by nightfall, the Canadian foro positions were being strengthened. In between bouts of violence, bread, wine, and other foods were passed around among the Canadians. Captain Sandy Mitchell found a mandolin and a microphone and played Silent Night for his worn-out soldiers. At Santa Maria di Constantinopoli, the organ was played as the men feasted on pork pie and pudding and drank beer. In the German lines, engineer Carl Bayerlein wrote, We had potatoes, oranges, vegetables, roast beef. We also put up a small Christmas tree. But he added, There is no place for Christmas sentiments here. We do not know how long we can hang on to Ortona. Boxing Day was even less merry than Christmas. At Dead Horse Square, an old woman, driven mad by the fighting, entered the area yelling and screaming. She was shot, likely by a German sniper. The Canadians could not clear out her body before an Allied tank rolled over her corpse, which was soon nothing but a bloody mush. Fresh replacements arrived and were sent directly into the battle, causing Company Sergeant Major Jock Gibson to muse, Lambs to slaughter. They're sending us bloody lambs who will just get butchered here. One hour later, Gibson mentally collapsed and muttered, None of us are going to get out of Ortona alive. Even Vokes, who normally relished a fight, was considering pulling out of Ortona, but he was advised that the town was nearly won. Indeed, that day, tanks finally reached the positions north of Ortona, which forced the paratroopers back. The Germans had to either escape or face destruction. By December 27th, Ortona was front page news in all the Allied countries. CBC reporter Matthew Halton wrote, An epic thing is happening amid the crumbling and burning walls. For seven days and seven nights, the Canadians have been trying to clear the town. And the action is as fierce as perhaps modern man has ever fought. For seven days and seven nights, the Canadians have been attacking in Ortona. Yard by yard, building by building, window by window. And for seven days and seven nights, the sullen young zealots of a crack German parachute division have been defending like demons. The battle, though, was coming to a close. With the escape route nearly cut, the Germans began to fall back to the north end of town. The Canadians pressed their advantage. By now, mouse holing had become a perfected tactic, and buildings fell one by one. Lemelson ignored Hitler's orders and left Ortona that night. Bayerlein later wrote in his diary, There is no town left, only the ruins. The enemy gained a destroyed city. 
we left undefeated. The Canadians suffered 502 dead at the Moreau River and Ortona, all of which were buried in the Moreau River Cemetery just south of town. Over 1,800 were wounded, another 1,600 lost due to illness and exhaustion. The month was dubbed Bloody December by the Canadians. Still, the men were proud of having beaten the best the Germans had to offer. Folks reported, we smashed the 90th Panzer Grenadier Division and we gave the 1st German Parachute Division a mauling which we will long remember. The Germans were not elated by the battle. Losses were heavy, with around 200 dead alone at Ortona itself. Lemelson was particularly despondent over the heavy losses. Kesselring knew that the Allies made Ortona appear as important as Rome, and asserted that he had to hold the town for a few extra days, mostly because of the press coverage the battle received. However, the Germans had managed to blunt Montgomery's offensive and ensure he did not gain any strategic objectives. Ortona's population suffered far more than the Axis or the Allies. About 1,300 of its 10,000 residents died in December alone. To make matters worse, the Allies could barely force the Germans back due to the heavy losses. The priority given to the Anzio landings and the fight at Monte Cassino meant that Montgomery's offensive was the last in the area for five months. In that time, German artillery north of Ortona shelled the town, making it nearly useless as a supply base. While the Canadians attained a high reputation for taking on the best the Germans had to offer, the bloody battle was ultimately an Axis victory. <laughs>